In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome. I was there the day that Jesus walked into the temple. He just stood there at first, almost as in disbelief. And then I saw it. I saw that fire growing in his eyes. I'd come from Galilee to the place where God said he'd meet us. Did it feel like a scam? Yeah. I was never able to afford a lamb for my sacrifice, so I had to settle for one of those overpriced pigeons. As a young wife and mother, there's a word you never expect to be called. Widow. I didn't realize how safe I'd felt with my husband around until he was gone. And then it just felt like being exposed on every side with nothing in between your babies and a world of vipers. But me, just me. So I stood there that day in the temple and I watched as Jesus grabbed a whip and drove those businessmen out of the temple, poured their money on the ground. But more than that, there was something about the expression on his face. I recognized it. He swung that whip like vipers were threatening his kids. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> Took me three years to figure out what he meant. <laughs> Slow learner. <laughs> he wasn't talking about the building. That was a place where dishonest men put their grimy fingerprints all over God's glory. They defiled the intimate process of worshiping Him. That day wasn't about destruction. It was about hope. Because now, knowing God is all about Jesus. As I think about that day back in the temple, and I remember what Jesus did and how he did it. It felt like being rescued. Life can still be brutal. The kids' appetites are still growing. I still cry a lot. made a place for me to be still, where rest and trust meet right there at God's feet. And the price of that access, it's paid because of Jesus. He conquered death, and that's how I make it through life. Good evening, Radiant. We're walking through the book of John for the next seven years or so. <laughs> Just kidding. We'll get there when we get there, right? And we're asking the important questions. Why did Jesus come? Who is Jesus? Why is that even important to me? And we're going to walk through some difficult stories and, and, and learn more about them. Stories like we just heard. Difficult story like we're going to read today. As you can see, Jesus in the temple. 
a, a picture of Jesus that we don't always picture. I mean, we think of Jesus oftentimes as, you know, he's this nice, humble figure with a smile and he's petting a lamb or something like that. And, and, and this Jesus has got a whip. It's a different one. What do we do with that Jesus? So we're going to walk through that this evening, and I encourage you to to join along with us. In your chairs is a Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you, take that. It is your gift. It's free from us. Or maybe there's somebody around you that you would like to walk through John with, somebody who's exploring or asking questions. They're free. Take one with you and read it. Now, there's a couple of things that I can say that perk my, ear, my wife's ears up pretty quick at the house. A couple of those are, hey, I'm going to go clean the basement or straighten the garage. And the reason those will perk her ears up is because my wife and I have two very different ideas about our stuff. I'm a little more of a minimalist, less is more in my life. And so if I go out and I see a bunch of stuff and I look at it, I think, well, if we haven't used this in a couple years and I don't see us using this anytime soon, it's got to go. My wife, on the other hand, looks at it and says, if there's any possibility we will use this in the next 20 years, we need to keep it. And this could be a source of tension in our house. But as I go and I want to straighten up and clean, I just realize there's just some times stuff's got to go. There are times you got to clean the house. We're going to talk about that a little bit today as we discuss a story. And we talked last week that, that John is a story. And like a lot of stories, there's an introduction. And in that introduction often leads to some tension and buildup of that tension, which eventually leads to a, a climax and a resolution of some sort. And the gospel of John's going to be no different. We're going to walk through a story just like that. And we introduced some characters last week. One of those characters being one called John the Baptist a very important character. And what we learned about John the Baptist is he was out in the wilderness and he was preaching repent and he was calling people to to have their sins forgiven and be baptized, which is a wonderful thing. But as the crowds grew and he baptized more people, he began to get noticed by the religious leaders of his day who came looking for him to ask him if you're a particular group of people, but ultimately what they were saying to him was, what gives you the authority? What gives you the right to baptize? Because the temple is where people go to get baptized, and us priests are the people who are supposed to do the baptizing. So you, some dude sitting out in the wilderness, you're telling people their sins can be forgiven and that they can be baptized. What gives you the right? Where do you get your authority? And this was a constant tension that was going to exist and we're going to build on. And so, isn't it interesting when we get to John chapter 2, verse 18, and now we've got Jesus on the scene, we read this verse. And it says, the Jews responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this all? So here we go again. These religious leaders are around him, and they were originally questioning John. Hey, what gives you the right? What gives you the authority? Now they're looking at Jesus and asking the same thing. What gives you the right? What gives you the authority? Because whatever Jesus is doing, he's got their attention. So let's ask ourselves, what is Jesus doing? Now before we answer that, and we've already got a hint of that from the video, we need to go back because we need to remember in the, in the Gospel of John, each story is building on each other along the way. And so when we go back last week and John the Baptist sees Jesus coming at a distance, he says something to him. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And at first glance, we're like, oh, that's beautiful language. That's so cool. But we also talked about just how seditious that statement, in other words, just how controversial that statement would have been to the religious leaders of his day. While we say that's really pretty, the religious leaders of the day and the people that were there would have understood what John the Baptist was saying. Because if you wanted to have your sins forgiven, there was only one proper way to do it at that time. Typically, you made a journey 
to Jerusalem once a year at a, at a festival they called Passover. You made that journey each year, and when you got to Jerusalem, you went to the temple, and you exchanged your Roman coins for temple-certified money because Roman coins were impure and unclean, and you couldn't use those in the temple, and, and they're there to help you out. So they've got the temple-certified money for you, and you took that temple-certified money, and you went and you bought a temple-certified sacrifice. And then you took that temple certified sacrifice and you went to the temple certified priest. You paid your temple certified tax so that they could sacrifice in the temple certified way. Are you getting the idea of what's going on here? They owned this thing called sacrifice. If you wanted your sins forgiven, you went to the temple and you did it the temple way. So you can imagine what they're feeling when you've got this guy out in the wilderness looking at Jesus and saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What he is essentially saying to those religious leaders is, hey, dudes, your day's up. It's coming to an end. They are numbered. Things are changing. This guy, Jesus, is about to turn things completely upside down. And that power and that control and that authority that you're holding on to is coming to an end. The real lamb is Jesus. It was a powerful statement and they would have understood it for exactly what it was. And John was now on their list, you know? And so now, as we go back to John, or in John chapter two, we're gonna pick up this story with Jesus and in John chapter 2, verse 13, it says this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, that's interesting, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at the table exchanging money. So here we go. We open the story with Jesus. He's in Jerusalem. It's Passover, and they're doing exactly what we've been talking about. They're exchanging money, and they're selling animals. This is no accident. John is building his story and his case. The tension is rising, and so it's no accident they are there. So what does Jesus do? In verse 15, it says, he, that is Jesus, made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables to those who sold doves. He said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. First things first, going into the temple and doing this is a really bad idea. Not good. Remember, talked about last week, the Romans in particular were interested in two things mainly, pay your taxes and keep the peace. This is not keeping the peace. He would have landed on both Rome and the religious leaders' radars at this point. If he hadn't got their attention yet, he's got it now. It's a bad idea to go do this. But why did Jesus do this? Well, he said right at the end there, why? Stop turning my father's house into a market. And the reality was this, the religious leaders were getting rich off of this thing, man. They had the market cornered on sacrifice. And both ancient historians and our archaeological digs and records show that, that the religious leaders of that day, man, they lived high on the hog. They had the best houses. They wore the best clothes. They had the best wine. They were doing very well off of this temple sacrifice thing. And Jesus didn't like it. In fact, at one point in Matthew, he would say to them, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but, they are, but the inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. You've cleaned the outside, but inside you're filthy, Jesus really didn't like what was going on. And we're going to talk about five principles real quick because we're going to get through this in a hurry, but five principles that we need to take away from this story. And these are your fill-ins on the back of your, of your worship guides if you want to follow along with that. 
What's the first principle Jesus is trying to show us in this story? It's this. Church is not about money. It's not. It might surprise you to hear that. Church isn't about money. We are not a business, and we don't do what we do to make a profit. That is not what church is about. It was not what the temple was supposed to be about. Church is about people. It is about the kingdom of God. It is about community. A group of people doing life together, being molded into the image of God and becoming more like Jesus in all that they do. Our product isn't money or profit. Our product is disciples who make disciples who make disciples. But the temple had forgotten this. The temple had made it about money when the temple was supposed to be a place of worship and prayer a place to grow in their journey with God. The second thing is it sent the wrong message when they made it all about money. And the, and the message that it said was this, and that we need to understand you cannot buy your way to God. They were sending a message that you could. And listen, for, for many, many of you out there, you faithfully give, and we're so enormously appreciative of that. It does, it does take money to do what we're doing in today's day and age. But I need to ask you a question, a, a tough question. If you, if you give, if you're one of the ones who, who gives to the church and, and, and gives to God, I want to ask you a simple question. Why? Why do you give? And listen, this isn't a sermon about giving and tithing, so you can relax. But what we find out is what you spend your money on says a lot about your heart. And so we have to ask the question, if you give, why do you give? Do you give out of compulsion? In other words, do you give to get God off your back? To make God happy? If I give, God will be pleased with me. In other words, are you trying to earn your way towards God or by your way towards God because this was the message the temple was sending. Listen, you come in, especially if you're wealthy, man, you can buy the best lambs and get the best priests and your sins will be forgiven better than anybody's because you bought the best, man. You buy it, you get it. And what we find out as we discover more and more about Jesus Christ is this idea that you can buy your way to God or, or somehow earn God's favor and love is completely against his teachings and what the Bible teaches us. You cannot earn God's love. You cannot buy God's love. You already have it. You don't lose it. My dear friends, if you've never heard that before, this is good news. God loves you just the way you are. You don't buy your way to God. You can't earn God's love. You already have God's love. Our problem isn't trying to get God's love. Our problem is receiving God's love and his free gift that he offers you no strings attached. And that's the gift of forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It's a gift and he's giving it in love. But for some reason, many people take on this idea that if I give, I'll get God off my back. That somehow God's angry at me. He's mad at me. Nothing could be further from the truth. We don't earn our way towards God. And the temple was sending that message because the temple had made it about money. The second idea or third, sorry, idea we need to understand about this story is one we'll, we'll dig out a little more. And this is where, where Matt's story was so awesome for tonight. Thank you, Matt. And that idea is this. We are called as a church to make room for everyone. Now, what do you mean by that, Jason? Where is that in this story? It's real subtle. 
But it's interesting, and for us to understand it, we have to do a little bit of history lesson here. So sorry if uh, this bores you, but we got to do it. The temple in the first century was huge. It was enormous. It kind of gives you a little bit of a, a picture right there. But, but looking at that, that's kind of complicated and confusing. And so I want to look at the next slide, which, which gives us a simpler understanding of the temple. And the, the temple had layers to it in many ways. And each layer was a deeper and deeper walker, getting closer and closer to God because they believed that God dwelt in what's called the Holy of Holies and that. And so it had layers. And one of those layers was called the Court of the Gentiles. And there was a reason it was called the Court of the Gentiles. And there was a reason they had this place called the Court of the Gentiles. First, we have to ask ourselves, what's a Gentile? Well, a, a Gentile is a person who doesn't follow Judaism, who wasn't a Jew, who wasn't practicing their religion. But they are people that may have questions, they may be exploring, they may want to learn more. And so they had a place in the temple for them because they couldn't go into the inner courts area. But they had a place for people who may have questions, who may be hurting, who may want to know more, talk to somebody. They had a place where they could come pray, where they could come worship. They made room for the Gentiles in the temple complex. But when they started selling animals and when they started exchanging money and doing everything they were doing, do you have any guess where they were set up? They set up in the court of the Gentiles. And what had been a space for people who could come and ask questions and learn more and pray and worship and take first steps in their journey towards God, they now had taken it over and said, listen, this is about what we need. This meets our wants and our desires. This is now our place. And the point is this. Did you know sometimes churches can do that as well? Did you know sometimes churches can become what we call inward? Which means they get more concerned about their wants, needs, and desires, and they forget that there are people who are far from God, who have questions, who have answers, who need a place to take those steps in a journey. A place that looks at a skateboarder and says, you're welcome here. They had taken over that space. And they had forgotten that there are people who are far from Jesus, far from God. And that is something we cannot do. We must make room. Fourth principle we have to remember is this. Don't forget the poor and the hurting. Notice specifically when Jesus was in the court, courtyard with a whip he addressed the people selling doves in particular. And he said to the people selling doves, he said, get these out of here. And what's interesting is the first four books, we call those the Gospels in the New Testament, all four of them have an account of Jesus in the temple with a whip driving out the money lenders. And of the four, three of them mention the dove vendors in particular. Why? Well, it might be interesting that in the Old Testament, in a book called Leviticus and in other places, they had made provisions for the reality that not everybody in Israel could afford a lamb. And so it was built into the law that you could purchase a pigeon or a dove in lieu of a lamb. But guess what was happening in the temple court? In their need to make money and turn it into a marketplace they began to raise the prices higher and higher on the doves and the pigeons. This was talked about by outside sources. I, I, I wanted to bring one up. In particular, it was a rabbi from that in, in, in a book called The Mishnah. And it, it simply said this, because of greed, the market for birds rose so much that not even the poorer women of the community could afford them. They had created a situation that oppressed the poor and no longer gave them access to God either. And consistently through the Bible, we read stories time and time again. You want to get God's attention? Turn your back on the poor, the oppressed, the widows, and the orphans. 
God consistently is reminding us that we are to reach out, that we are to engage, that we are to love, that we are to be God's image, his people in the world, caring for those who can't always care for themselves or need a help. In their zeal to make more money and turn it into a marketplace, they had blinded themselves to the poor and they were oppressing them and nothing could be further than from the way of God. Matthew 9, 13, Jesus even said at one point to the religious leaders, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In other words, if you're sacrificing, even if you're doing all the right thing and following all the right rules, but you turn a blind eye to the poor and the oppressed and the hurting and the orphans and the widows, your sacrifice means nothing to me. I desire mercy. Mercy first. And when they turned the temple court into a marketplace and began oppressing the poor, they lost who they were and why they were chosen to do what they do. They forgot the poor, they forgot the orphans, they forgot the widows. The last key to this story is subtle as well, too but the most important point, and that's this. Sometimes you have to clean out the yeast. Now you might be thinking, what in the world are you saying here, Jason? What are you getting at? What do you mean I gotta clean out the yeast? Remember, John's building on a story here and he's given us some hints. One of the hints is that Jesus is there at Passover. In fact, he's there the week before Passover, which is called a week of preparation. They're preparing, they're buying their sacrifices, they're getting ready to do what they do. It's the week before. And it's no accident that it's Passover. John wants us to know that. And so when we read in Exodus chapter 12, 15, we begin to see and understand the mystery that's built into that. And it says, in concerning Passover, on the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. Now, the long and short of, the, long and short of it is this. Yeast represented during this time sin. And the, the point that they were being, that was being made and it was symbolic of was this reality that only a little bit of yeast is needed to, to infect the entire dough. It only takes a little bit of yeast to run through the entire piece of dough. And what the, the ancient Israelites were learning and God was pounding into them was this idea. Listen, it only takes a little bit of sin to ruin the whole. It only takes a little bit to work its way through the entire body. And so getting rid of the yeast was symbolic of removing sin, purifying your house, and preparing yourself to see God work. And so what do we have here is we have Jesus in the temple, which happens to be called the house of God, with a whip driving out the money changers and those who are selling sacrifices. What's he doing? He's cleaning out the yeast. He's preparing for Passover. Get this stuff out of my house. My father's house is a house of prayer and worship. He's cleaning out the yeast. Which gets us to our so what moment. While Jesus is cleaning out the temple and cleaning out the yeast and the things that need to go, what we begin to learn later in the New Testament from writers like Paul after Jesus' death and resurrection is this. And for instance, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says... Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, 
whom you received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so if our bodies are a temple, our lives are a temple, we have to ask a very important question, a big takeaway from this entire story, and that's this. What yeast needs to be cleaned out of you? What does God need to remove in you? If you are to purify, if you are to prepare, if you're to be ready for God to work in your life, what's getting in the way? Is it shame, anger? Is there someone you need to forgive? Is it an addiction you're holding on to? What is it? And then there's a second, last important question that we need to ask with it that's just as important. And that question is this, are you willing to, to let Jesus do what needs to be done? And here's why I bring that up. I, I could have stopped just with the question, you know, what does God need to remove in you? That, that's a, a hard enough question. But I asked the question, are you willing to let Jesus do what needs to be done for this reason? Our picture is of Jesus with a whip driving out the money lenders. It's violent. It's fierce. It is intentional. And if we're being real with ourselves and we're saying, I know what that thing is that needs to be removed in my life, we also know that we don't always like it, do we? That the process of purifying us isn't always a great one. I will tell you, the people who were in the temple court who were getting whipped and yelled and screamed at and their money was flying probably weren't really thrilled in the moment either. And when God gets to work in us and begins to change us and transform us more and more into the image of his son, it's not always something we enjoy. And so the question is, are you willing to walk through that journey to allow God to transform you? Because it may hurt and it may be painful, but it's worth it. Because only when the pain of staying the same becomes worse than the pain to get better, will we change, right? Are you willing to let God do that? You say, why? Why do we do that? And that's simply this last verse, I promise, and that's, it's just this, that while they were in Jerusalem at the Passover, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. And what I mean is this. When people see this God, this Jesus at work inside of you, transforming you, when they see us as a church body reaching out to the poor, the oppressed, the widows, and the orphans, when they see that we make room for everybody to come and begin those first steps and to explore God in a safe place, and we say, come as you are, when we truly do those things, they see Jesus through us, and when they see this Jesus working in and through us, they believe in his name. What's God need to remove in you so that the people around you will say, there is a God and he really does transform people and I need him. Let's pray. Dear God, it's my hope and desire that uh, as you do, your Holy Spirit just fills each of us, shows us those things that need to change, maybe those things we already know about, but even some of those hidden things in our hearts. Lord, may we be a people who have the courage to say, I am willing to walk through whatever it takes for God to take the yeast out of my life and transform me more and more to the image of his son. And if there's anybody today, Lord, that has not made that decision to say, I believe, may today be the day they step over that line and pray and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I need him. And so we love you. In your name, amen.